Hi there, I'm Eric Wordweaver Shervin, Gothi of the Ridgar Folk here in East Texas, and I would like to welcome you to The Raven's Call. This is a show where I ramble on about different heathen-related subjects, just kind of whatever strikes my fancy, sets my mind on fire at the time. A uh, big UPG warning at the beginning of this episode, like all my episodes. Uh, this is just my take on heathenry. This is not some big, you know, I am the authority on everything, uh, this is how you do it, or you're doing it wrong. Forgive the birds. Um, I'm on location. I, I am just one go the one guy doing heathenry my way. This is based on my years of experience and the research that I have done. I keep in mind I am not a hardcore recon. I am not a neo pagan fluffy bunny. I'm somewhere in between. I'm organic in my approach and I have this philosophy that heathenry is like a tree. It's rooted in tradition but has the room to grow in new and exciting ways. So that's kind of an approach from where I am and who I am. So take that as you will. These videos are only meant to be conversation starters at best, or maybe to get you thinking outside the box a little bit in your own practices. So make of that what you will. All right, guys, we've just recently hit 2,000 subscribers, and I just want to say thank you all so much for that. I, it warms my heart to know you guys are enjoying the content enough to stick around and to see what crazy thing I'm going to throw out next. Um, I know my channel tailors a lot to beginners, but I try to put some more advanced stuff out there periodically. And so uh, do please keep the comments coming. You guys give some great comments, and I do not get to give them the attention that they're due frequently. Um, excuses aside, I just don't get to. And uh, I really enjoy reading them. I really enjoy seeing these different takes on heathenry that are out there, uh, seeing how your hall does things. And I really, really enjoy getting those, you hear the cicadas, you can tell it's summertime in Texas. Um, I really enjoy getting these uh, viewer requests or recommendations or suggestions for topics because they give me avenues that I may not have thought to go down and I, I genuinely enjoy them. Today's is one of those. So without any further ado, uh, please ding the bell, subscribe, all that stuff down below. But without any further ado, let's jump in <coughs> to today's subject. Now, Miss Amelia, I have referenced her on the channel before. Uh, she's a friend of ours, a uh, friend of my tribe here in the area. And uh, she is, she's a smart lady. And she comes up with some really cool questions and some really cool topics from time to time. And uh, this one was one that came kind of from some of her own experiences and uh, some experiences that she's talked to some other people on and experiences that I have dealt with other people on. Um, I didn't even think to do a video about it until she recommended it. I'm like, you know what? That's an excellent idea. I've seen the same thing. So, and the subject is the crisis of faith. Um, <laughs> this is a complex thing. Now, I'm utilizing the term crisis of faith because it is the term that everybody knows. It's the common vernacular for a phenomena wherein one questions one's own belief structure because of any number of uh, traumatic or crisis events that end up giving them doubt. Now, a lot of people came to heathenry as a crisis of faith from Christianity, um, some from Judaism, but mostly from Christianity or from non-denominational you, you get the picture. Um, some found their way here through paganism, but a lot of those came from one of the more monotheistic religions, one of usually the big three, what we call the big book religions. Um, those that have a book to go to, you know, and this is your, this is your book. Um, heathenry is not a book religion. We're, we're weird. Uh, <laughs> we're story religion, but we're not a book religion. It's a thing. So, somebody out there just took a drink, I know. that. It, it, They've got a game going where every time I say it's a thing, somebody takes a shot. They're going to kill themselves doing this. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. Um, and apparently everybody loved the whole hashtag Pop-Tart Ancestors thing a couple weeks ago. That was cool. <laughs> I did not expect that one to take off. Anyway, so um, the gist here is that a lot of heathens came to heathenry from either a straight route from one of the big book religions or from a circuitous route from there. But a lot of heathens have that kind of background and that kind of baggage. 
Uh, this is not something that I personally have a lot of experience with because I was not brought up in a religious household. I was able to kind of explore and find my way uh, without having to shuffle off the baggage of a previous religion. But that's not to say that I didn't have baggage from Western society already imposed upon me, which is heavily influenced by those big book religions. Um, so to say that I'm, I'm completely divested of any kind of influence from that would be erroneous and and just, no, no. I, I do have my baggage. It's just not the same kind of baggage as someone who's actually brought up in the church because they, they've got a whole different bag of stuff. <laughs> so um, the gist here is that sometimes life gets crazy. Sometimes things get out of control. Sometimes life does weird and unpredictable things. And it's an, a phenomenon within human beings to turn to faith, turn to belief, and expect some kind of solution, answer, fix, if you will. And when that doesn't come in the form that they expect, well, then they begin to question whether or not the one to whom they are calling actually exists. So, and I, listen guys, this is the basic human experience, all right? I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that blind faith is the only way. Most heathens came to heathenry because they don't like the blind faith aspects of the big book religions. Um, they fled from those kind of things. Um, I actually have had long conversations with a, a dear departed friend of mine, uh, Rod Landreth. Some of you all know him. Uh, incredible Gothi back in the day. I, I loved this man. He was, he was just a wonderful friend, dear friend, and a deep mind. And he and I would sit and think uh, over the fire long on certain subjects and the rare occasions we actually got to get together. We're a couple states apart. But uh, one of the subjects that we frequently liked to talk about was whether or not the term faith has any place in heathenry. Because faith in and of itself is a term that indicates kind of blind belief, that, that an, an overarching trust that is unconditional in nature. Um, Having faith that something is there means that you cannot see it and you're just taking it for granted that it's there. You're taking it on faith. And that's not a very heathen way to do things. Heathens, heathens see the gods around us. We see Thor in the thunder clouds. We see and hear Odin on the winds. Uh, we, we hear the Vaitir about us. You know, We, we see Strona's rays shining down on us every day. Um, we see Brother Mani pulling the moon across the sky every night. Um, yes, you know, there, there is an immaterial, unseen aspect of things, but we see the, the very present essence of the gods as they continue to do what they do. And uh, we feel their presence in ritual. Uh, we engage in an ongoing relationship with the gods. So <clears throat> the term belief uh, is stronger stronger. It still has that essence of the unseen, uh, but there's not that that inherent blind faith element to it, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. It's one of those that it, it's, it's very much a give-and-take relationship, and uh, so the term faith, and it's a more complex conversation that I could actually probably do an entire video on faith and heathenry, uh, but the whole point of it was that the term faith really doesn't fit with heathenry. Belief structure does, um, especially in so much of us, so much of our belief structure is outside of just the religion. It's also the folk beliefs, it's also the cultural beliefs, etc. Et it's a thing. Anyway, uh, so the crisis of faith in this instance is actually more of a crisis of belief. And even then, the crisis in, itself, in and of itself is more a moment of doubt. So let's talk about these moments of doubt. What gives rise to these moments of doubt when one doubts the existence of the gods, when one doubts that the gods are there for them or, or that they are listening to them? Why do we have these doubts? Why do they bother us so much? And why would they drive us from the culture way, the folk way, the worldview. Um, I would say a certain amount of it is baggage, and we'll get to that here in a second. 
And then I think a certain amount of it is just the nature of our expectations and worldview in general. So let's let's touch first on the you know kind of the worldview side of things when we're talking about uh, the presence of the gods. Okay, and this actually is going to dovetail with the whole baggage thing. Western society, and especially the Judeo-Christian. Uh, big book religions in general, including Islam and some of the other, uh, what I call big book religions, are they're notorious for teaching their people that you know their God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and evolved in every single aspect of your lives. If stuff's going wrong, it's because that deity has a plan, and it is involved in that plan. Okay. Um, one, that, that removes any essence of free will. Free will is not possible in any type of omniscient, omnipotent, or omnipresent situation. Uh, it's just not possible. It is an illusion at that point. Um, in this particular instance, we're not going back in that. Go back and watch my Omnis video if you want to hear me go on a like 45-minute tangent on all of that. Uh, very philosophical-based. Anyway. <clears throat> Western society teaches people that you know the big sky father is constantly watching and has a plan. If, if things are going wrong, if things are chaotic, it's all part of the plan. Trust in your God and trust that things will be fine. Have faith. Okay, That doesn't jive with heathen worldview. We're not, we're not a have faith kind of thing. Um, and part of that is because we have a different... See, we... My all, my call... My hall, my way, and uh, not my hall, not my call, kind of thing, you know? Um, what we're talking about here is a difference in worldview when it comes to the gods. Now, traditionally, uh, in what we would refer to as arch heathen times before Christian influence uh, in Northern Europe and mainland Northern Europe, um, Scandinavia, Northern Europe stuff, the, the gods were very much thought of as different. They were not involved in everyday aspects of life. You know, we look at the ritual structure, we look at the calendar, we look at uh, how rituals were done, mechanics of all that, and it leads us strongly to the belief that the gods are of limited access or limited presence, as we have talked about before on the channel. The gods are not always turning their eye to us. Now, the gods are grand and beyond our capacity to understand, but they still have their limitations. Uh, they still have their boundaries of self, uh, and therefore their attention is turned in directions. It can be many directions, but it cannot be all directions. And so the gods are not always listening. The gods are not always invested in the goings-on in a life of one particular individual. The gods tend to operate more on big-scale stuff. Now, that's not to say that the gods cannot take an interest in those uh, those individuals. It's entirely possible. Um, I know some people who have experienced what they feel is a very personalized interaction with the gods and goddesses amidst their personal lives. Um, one, one has to keep in mind, too, that fey folk like to get involved, fey folk vates here, uh, Huldra sometimes like to get involved and, and play tricks on people. Uh, but it's the gods are incredibly powerful. And so it is not outside their possibility to manifest within the lives of an individual if they so choose. Um, I'm not one to tell the gods what they can and can't do, obviously. <laughs> but by and large, I find that most of the time the gods are not involved on a granular level with our our daily lives. There's not some grand scheme, not some big plan that is all playing out according to their will. Um, that's predestination, folks, and that is not how this works. Uh, we're, we're very much, the future is an ephemeral thing. It's not a, it's not real yet. I've really got to do my even causality and timeline thing. Um, the future is not real yet. It's ephemeral, it's smoke, it's mirrors. The only thing that is real in the here and now is the here and now. And um, because of that, predestination doesn't work. We don't know what's going to happen. The gods haven't dictated what's going to happen. That's not how that works. 
So, grand scheme of things, uh, just from a cosmology side of things, it just doesn't jive to expect the gods to be present in every little crisis in your lives, um, or even major crises. Uh, entire civilizations can rise and fall between the times that the gods turn their specific attention to a specific society, uh, especially if a particular society hasn't done a great deal to draw the attention of the gods. You know, in the olden days, entire societies, tribes, clans, would gather together and worship the gods and call attention to them, build their luck with the gods. And even then, um, life happened. You know, people starved, famines hit, illnesses struck. Um, the gods didn't protect people from that. That wasn't necessarily what the gods set out to do. The gods, when they created the world, set everything in motion and gave us the capacity to do it for ourselves. So I find a lot of times what the gods are really trying to do is watch how we handle things and uh, see what we bring to the table and uh, judge our worth through that when they do turn their attention to us. And if we show that we are capable and we are strong and we do what we do in right good faith and... Uh, go back and do the whole... If we do what we do. Yeah. All right. Three, two, one. Let's jam. I find that the gods typically look at us and see what we're going to do with it, you know? Uh, they want to see how we're going to handle things. You know, they, they, when they created the worlds and set things in motion, they gave us the capacity to do it for ourselves, and they're interested in seeing how we handle that. They're interested in seeing whether or not we bring honor to our names and ourselves and prove ourselves capable, at which point they see that as being worthy of recognition. We prove our worth, as it were. And uh, ex mm, mm, we're going to get into the next subject now. <laughs> this is a good dovetail. Uh, the next subject is expecting the gods to do it for us. I don't get that. <laughs> I do not get that. I don't understand where that comes from completely. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I do understand where it comes from. Philosophically, psychologically, I understand where the phenomenon comes from. I just don't really understand how someone who is uh, well set in the heathen worldview could adopt such a stance. Um, because uh, there's just no room for it. The gods don't do everything for us. I mean, you may pray to Thor as a Jotun is bearing down on your house to try and smite the thing and knock it away. Like when the tornado came through here. I am firmly convinced that Thor knocked that big bastard out of the way, and uh, that was the thing, you know, but it was probably just because he was already fighting the thing, and we just happened to say, hey, don't step on us, and they tried not to, you know. Some collateral damage, but nothing major, other than a house, but, you know, nobody was hurt. That was the thing. <laughs> if you haven't heard the story, check out my Weaving Words thing. I still have the Storm Riders up there. Uh, that's the story of the tornado that hit my house. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the gods don't do it for us. The gods expect us to do it for ourselves, like I said before. They are not there at our beck and call. They, they are not interested in stepping in and helping us out and coddling us and supporting us. History has shown that, if anything, the gods are rough and tumble on a lot of things. Uh, yes, there is propriety. Yes, there is... Uh, an, an approach that is more appropriate in nature as far as respect. And we're not talking about gods that are purely war gods or death gods that are, you know, bedecked with all this imagery, but they are, that is an aspect of them. You know, uh, all of the gods. You know, Thor is a god of farming and of war. Um, you know, Odin himself is the gallows god, and yet he's the leader of the tribe. You get a lot of multifaceted elements to the gods because life is multifaceted and they built it that way. <laughs> so we get that. You know, we expect that. And we do not expect them to step in and do it for us. Expecting them to come in and make the pain go away. That's a big book thing. Um, that, that, that's a big book approach. That is someone who has promised you that the Sky Daddy is going to come in and fix it for you. Uh, don't worry, child. Sky Daddy will make everything better. Um, our gods never promised that. Never. Our gods did not promise that. 
Um, we, some of it's an, uh, the origin of religion kind of thing, because if you look at like Christianity and all that and the way that it came up, Judaism, all the progression of all that, uh, most people when they step into Christianity are given a book, and the book tells them, you know, this is your God, this is what he says, this is what he believes, this is what he expects of you, and these are the tenets you need to follow in order to be a part of his club. And uh, heathenry's not like that. Heathenry wasn't handed their God and then told to observe him in the world around. Heathenry observed their gods in the world around and then began to make sense of that. The same way we make sense of chemistry, the way, way we make sense of physics. We make sense of religion the same way that we make sense of all these other things because the gods gifted us with the capability of doing that, of seeking that information out. We are far more capable than we frequently give ourselves credit for. So as we go through and we talk about the fact that the gods are of you know, limited presence, they've gifted us with all this capability, looking at our worth, trying to see what we bring to the table, and, and judging whether or not we are worthy by our actions and deeds, how we handle these things. Um, <clears throat> they gift us luck based on what we bring as a tribe, the sacrifices that we make, and the honor that we bring to them. And so, the more we bring to the table, the more value we have with the gods. So, the more we weather these storms, and the more we struggle with these things, and the better we handle them, the more worth we are to the gods. And therefore, the more luck we're likely to get from them. Now, you've seen my previous videos, hopefully, on uh, Ordeal Breeds Worth. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, it's just that Ordeal also breeds worth with the gods. Not just with each other, not just with what you bring to the table to your tribe and your growth and your personal growth. All of that's still true, but you're proving to the gods that you are someone who is worthy of their blessing, and therefore they will smile upon you and grant you with luck. So weathering these storms and surviving these things actually makes you better capable of handling them in the future. That's a fascinating thing in and of itself. So there's a difference in worldview. There's a difference in kind of how we view the inter interventions of the gods, all right? Um, and then all of that comes back to the whole, why a crisis of faith, you know? For a big book religion that is promised from the outset that, you know, the, the patron deity is going to protect you. It's going to do these things for you. It's there in the writing that they will protect you. They will take care of you, blah, 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 blah. And... I don't know how much it actually is. Keep in mind, I wasn't brought up in the church, so I don't have first-hand experience with all of the nuances of the belief structure, etc., etc. I know that it is generally accepted that it is the belief of the big book religions that they are entitled to certain things due to their belief in said deity, and that when said deity does not pay out on those things in the way that these people perceive that it should be... <sighs> That's the other point we're coming to. Then they have a crisis of faith, or a crisis of belief, or a doubt. That's what we're getting at, doubt. So, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> we were never promised that by the gods. They never ever promised us that, like I said. Now, th that I just touched on another aspect of this whole thing that is the, in the way they were promised, or in the way they felt they were promised, their perception of the situation, their perception of how this should work, that is so weighted and so heavy and you cannot discount it because perception is reality in a lot of cases. And so when people think that they are supposed to get a blessing in a certain way because of these preconceived notions, because they are, they are coming to conclusions without observing the world around them, then they fail to see the actual signs of their deity when the deity smiles upon them. Now, I have touched on this in the heathen stuff before as far as reading signs and symbols and uh, you know how do I know my offerings been accepted, things like that. You observe around you and look for patterns in the world. That's how we discovered the gods in the first place. That stands to reason that this is still the language in which we would communicate and that we would continue to learn of them and learn of their feelings through the same ways that we discover they even exist, that is through observation of pattern and reaction in the world around us. So, having any kind of preconceived notion as to how the gods are going to do something and handle that, you know, 
Uh, that, that's some heavy extrapolation. Yeah, from patterns you can tell if things have happened enough that you can probably expect luck to play out in a certain way-ish, kind of. Um, but, you know, the future is ephemeral. It is smoke and mirrors, like we said before, and is not a hard set thing. And this isn't something where they just plug in a, uh, a program and are like, oh, okay, well, they met the requirements for this, hit the switch, turn that function on, and then it runs the same way every time. It's not like that. Um, it's a very organic thing. They're going to gift us luck, and this energy is going to play out how it plays out. And in a lot of ways, our lives kind of decide how it's going to play out. You know, you may not see how the gods are blessing you with luck. Uh, like, when things get financially tough, and you get down to where you're only eating ramen because you just can't make it check to check, and yet somehow you make it to that next check, even if you had to go hungry for a little bit, you still made it. You didn't die of starvation. You didn't die of thirst. Um, there's luck in that, because you, you could have kind of thing, you know? So the blessings of the gods do come in different ways and different uh, different avenues. So then we get to the, that's the whole expectation of things, you know? You expect that the gods are going to step in and fix things for you, and then you expect them to step in and fix it in the way that you see it in your head. One, no, the gods are not going to step in and fix anything for you. You have to fix it for yourself. They're going to grant you the luck that you can wield into might and main and, and make things better for yourself if you've cultivated that relationship with the gods and they do grant you that luck. Uh, it's not a guarantee. You're not entitled. There's, there's no entitlement in heathenry. Um, there is reciprocal obligation, sure, um, which in and of itself, I guess, offers a, a, a semblance of entitlement. But entitlement means that you, you are just owed it. Um, and that's not true. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a gaius of obligation to reciprocate. Um, but that, that, that obligation dissipates if the relationship is no longer valued. And, you know, we talked before in previous videos about how shame only works if you actually want to belong to a society. Um, similarly, uh, the obligation to reciprocate, that, that depends heavily upon whether or not you wish to foster a relationship with that person, whether or not you want to engage in a cyclic obligation with them. You can choose not to engage in it, and the gods can choose not to engage with it with us as well. So, I mean, yeah, there is a possibility that gods may choose not to engage with us and not give us luck, which is why we do what we do, why we try to get better at ritual, why we try to get better at speaking to the gods and, and forging these relationships, why people like me do the research that we do and the thought processes and the, you know, why we rack our brains and how do we make ritual better and how do we better connect to the gods so that we can survive years like this, as he gestures at 2020 in general. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that we do. But when the gods don't step in and fix 2020, when the gods don't step in and make all the drama go away, when the gods don't step in and, and take away whoever it is you perceive to be the bad people, um, that, that doesn't mean the gods aren't there. It doesn't mean the gods aren't granting you luck. That's outer yard people doing outer yard stuff for the most part. I see a lot of people overly invested in outer yard stuff, and that's that's a whole different thing. And we're not getting into that because it starts to get political. Um, just there's, to a certain extent, outer yard is outer yard until it starts to encroach on my inner yard. And mm, I see a lot of people overly bothered with outer outer yard stuff, and are then ratcheting it up in ways that it's going to start affecting people's inner yards, and that's that's an overstep. You know, on both sides of everything here. Anyway, the gods aren't going to step in and fix this for us. But that doesn't mean that I have suddenly lost belief in the gods because I still see them around. I still see them doing what they do. The, gra the grass is still green. It still grows every spring. The, the storms continue to rage. The winds howl. Uh, souls pass on to the other side. The world continues to turn. Everything still ticks on. Because the big picture is so much bigger than our little problems in our lives. The crises that we experience don't even create a blip on the radar for the gods for the most part because they are so small. Now, they're huge to us because it's proportional. The gods are so much greater than us that, yes, of course, it's going to look like 
You know, the problems of an ant are nothing to a human. The problems of a human are like ants to the gods. They, when they want to look at the ant farm, they will. Um, <laughs> they'll, they'll put food in, make sure we're taken care of. Now I realize that I just did the whole ant farm heathen thing. Hashtag ant farm heathen. I don't like that. <laughs> anyway, so the gist is, though, that, you know, they pay attention and they gift us what we need to do what we need to do, but it's still on us to do it. And so throwing a hasty fit and stepping away from the folkway religion worldview means that, one, you probably never fully understood the worldview in the first place. You probably didn't fully grasp what it was to be heathen, as it were. Um, typically, I find people that find the whole crisis of faith thing is because they're trying to apply a westernized Judeo-Christian approach to deity onto a template of Norse heathenry, um, which you can do that with certain neo-pagan religions and still get away with it to a certain extent. But again, people still have these crises of faith, these moments of doubt, uh, when things don't play out exactly how they want it to, or they feel like they're not getting the connection to the gods and goddesses that they feel they should. Remember, uh, the gods are not always there. Um, sometimes the... Gods just give us a nod. Sometimes the gods give us their full attention. Sometimes they just go, okay, cool. And then they keep on going. And sometimes they just don't hear us. You know, we may holler out, hey, guys, we're here. Oh, you're not, okay. Well, I'll catch you next time around. Um, that kind of thing, you know. Um, they may not always hear us. It happens, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's a thing. But when we talk about these crises of faith, these moments of doubt, and we're talking about these, these entitled moments of, you know, the gods need to pay attention to me, and if they don't, then I'm just going to run away from the religion. Man, guys, come on. What are, we, what are we talking about here? And I have seen it numerous times. People will get in, they'll try, they, they think they're the coolest thing ever, they're going to set up a heathen tribe, uh, they rush to tribe, they don't develop themselves as individual heathens in their own solitary practice and hearth culture, etc., etc. They rush to make a tribe, um, they glom on to the system of whoever the most popular talking head is that they've found, or whoever's particular book was the first one that they came across that resonates with them, or whoever promised them that they could be the biggest, most badass Viking on the face of the planet and die in battle and go to Valhalla because they're going to incite rebellion, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, I've experienced all these. You know, these people expect these things. They get into that, and then they all of a sudden, you know, like, all right, well, I'm going to gift to the gods, and then the gods owe me this, and, you know, so I'll be big and strong and bad, and... Look, this isn't some kind of demonic pact, all right? It's not a contract. It is gifts freely given. There is a societal obligation. That is where the reciprocal obligation comes in. If they do not wish to honor the relationship, they don't have to reciprocate. You know, you've got to prove that you're somebody that's worth reciprocating to. Because to reciprocate is to establish obligation. It is. Um... Accepting your offer in the first place, accepting your sacrifice, is the initiation of the gift cycle. It is the initiation of the, the obligation cycle. That is the, I am now accepting this obligation to reciprocate. When I accept the gift, I accept the obligation to reciprocate. Only then can you say, if I don't pay out to you, that it was an insult and a betrayal. But if I don't accept your offering in the first place, then we never entered into any kind of social obligation, and I am absolved of any responsibility to you or for you. That's, that's just how it works. So, <clears throat> because of that, just because you stand up and you hail the gods, just because you call and say, hey, I'm heathen, blah, 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 does not necessarily mean that they've accepted your offerings. But it also doesn't mean they haven't. I mean, maybe they have. Maybe they have entered into the obligation, and you're just not recognizing how the luck is actually playing out in your life and that you actually are getting the blessings. You're just looking at it the wrong way. You're coming at it from the wrong angle. None of that's a reason to run away from heathenry because you didn't get what you wanted when you wanted it. You know, we've talked before about, you know, we don't do bloat to get a car. You do blow up to get the luck so that you will, you know, be able to turn that into, you know, the hard work to pay for a car or, 
you know, uh, an inspiration in a moment where you can turn a conversation towards a vehicle, then all of a sudden, boom, you have an opportunity to get one. You still have to do the work, but the opportunity suddenly arose. These, I mean, these are the kind of things that we see. That's how the gods play out. I'm not going to step in and just say, here's your car. That's not how it works. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do that. So anyway, all of this is all of this is round and round and round about the central point of these moments of doubt are going to happen. And that's the one thing that, despite all the logic and all the explanation and worldview, these moments of doubt are going to happen. It's okay. Um, that That's fine. Um, you know, nobody's telling you you have to take the gods on faith. Nobody's telling you you have to step in and you have to believe in them, etc., etc. Look around the world and observe. All right? Just so happens that the observations I make when I look around the world match what other people call heathenry. And so I kind of fit into that label. Um, but ultimately, nobody can tell you what to believe. And if they try to, they're wrong. All right? I'm not going to tell you you're doing it wrong, but if they're trying to di dictate or control what you believe, they're wrong. Period. The end. I don't care if that's the tenets of their religion. They're wrong. You believe what you believe. And that's all there is to it. And so, you know, don't let, don't let logical fallacies, don't let, uh, you know, twists in worldview that came from outside sources damage your relationship with the gods and goddesses and damage, damage your belief in them. Um, observe for yourself. Look for yourself, but do keep in mind you may not have all the answers yet. You may need to learn a little bit more. Look around and get some more uh, interpretive information from the world around you. You have so many different avenues that you can see the signs of the gods, the blessings of the gods, and they do speak in, in code sometimes. But it's there. If you learn to look for it and learn to speak the language. Because they're not going to answer you in words and they're not going to just slam a car down in front of your house and say, there. That's not how it works. So anyway, that was a long and roundabout way of getting back to the point of uh, crises of faith. And don't let them discourage you. You know, Look at why you're having that moment. But remember that maybe things aren't what you expect them to be or what you're trying to force them to be. Slow down, observe the world around you, see what's actually going on, and then make your decisions. You know, don't run away from the folkway just because, you know, Odin didn't get you a car, or because, you know, let's, let's face it, somebody has medical problems and is maybe passing, or has, you know, ended up in jail, this, that, and the other. The gods are not going to absolve us of our own deeds that may end us up in a situation like jail or something like that. Um, the gods are not going to absolve us of the luck that we've inherited from our Orlog. Um, they're going to look at how we deal with that and how we overcome that and what we do with it. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to be some shining prince on the other side. Uh, Odin takes interest in some peculiar individuals sometimes from what I've seen. Um, and also the gods are not going to be able to save anyone because, you know, Cattle die, kinsmen die. You know, death is inevitable. And so they're not going to step in and try and heal everyone. Uh, Lady Air will step in sometimes and grant some healing, or at least the capacity to find healing ourselves. And uh, she grants us that bit of luck that we need to, to strengthen the healing process within the capacities that we have. Medicine, um, strength of will, things like that. Uh, so that maybe somebody can try and pull through it and then see what they do with it. Um, she's not going to come down and lay hands and, and heal. That's just not how it works. So anyway, uh, measure your expectations, understand where baggage comes from, and then recognize the fact that it's okay to doubt sometimes. It's fine. That, that happens. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and sign off on this one. Thank you, Amelia, for the recommendation. I really appreciate it, guys. Y'all keep coming back. Y'all keep giving me comments. Uh, feed me show ideas, and I will turn them into stuff like this. And hopefully, hopefully next time, we won't be serenaded by the cicada. Let me sing you the song of my people. That's the national anthem of Texas. Anyway, hail to you all. Thank you. May your hearth fires burn bright.
Right, getting set up. This is going to be the one on crises of faith. <sighs> oh, bloody hell. Back on site. Uh, back in the wild. At my house. I try and settle that out some. It's acting kind of funny. We shall see. Do I usually flip this around the other way? Thinking I do. Thinking I usually have the camera pointed the other way. But that's okay. Um, I, I can work with it. That's fine. That's fine. I think I sometimes have my iPhone flipped the other way. Anyway, <laughs> this has been an absolutely nuts week. I know I've been, uh, you, you've all, you've all, bra, you have all heard me. <laughs> I'm glad this is already the blooper reel. You've already heard me talk about how crazy my work weeks can get. Well, this one's been exceptionally so. So I'm just kind of trying to sneak one in here, um, which is why I'm filming back at my property. Um, but I like it. I kind of like the backdrop and everything. I think it's nice. So anyway, uh, we're not going to worry too terribly much about prologue and stuff. Uh, just suffice to say that it's been nuts, guys. 2020 is off the chain. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if somebody opened Pandora's box or what, but um, freaking whew, the Pandorica is open. Um, <laughs> sorry, Whovians get it. Um, this is and this has been particularly nuts. This this year is ridiculous beyond belief on so many different levels, and um, man, we're all just trying to stay afloat. So hang on out there. Actually, this kind of has a lot to do with today's subject too. So we'll go ahead and get into today's subject. So we're live in three, two, one. Let's jam. Pause. I wanted to readjust my microphone, microphone, microphone. I want to readjust my microphone. Maybe, possibly. That's gonna make some noise. Sorry, guys. Dad, come on. We're gonna flip and do that. All right, cool. All right, we're back in three, two, one. Let's jam. <laughs> 